Let me. So, happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back to the 2016 All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. We have had so many great topics this year, and we're going to continue today as we learn more about Snake ID. Remember to please type any questions that you have during the webinar into the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. And something important, as our speaker wraps up today, there's going to be a few survey questions as well as a link to a few more. We would really appreciate your input. In fact, it was your comments that have uh, dictated the 2017 Good Bug, Bad Bug schedule. So before I introduce the speaker, I would like to thank the following e-extension communities of practice because they bring these webinars to you. These yes. are important clients. Urban RPM, Alabama Extension, Texas A&M, Life Extension Service, Clemson Cooperative Extension, and the University of Georgia Extension Center for Urban Agriculture. Now, it is with great pleasure, and y'all may have noticed that the speaker has changed in the last week, so we really, really appreciate Ms. Katrina Duchet for coming in and stepping up to the plate. She is originally from New York City and has moved to Colorado where she is enrolled in a professional science master's degree program in zoo management. She was at Turtleback Zoo over the past summer and conducted research on reptile behavior and has assisted Mike Lyons with reptile training and enrichment. So, Ms. Boucher, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. And Thank you for your time. I'm very excited to be a part of this. Um, I've never done a webinar before, so please forgive me for any sort of discrepancies or little hiccups, but let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about North American snake identification. So we'll be talking mostly about just species that we'll find here in the United States, and I'm going to do my best to give you a very well-rounded course in uh, identifying different species. All right. So... I just want to go over some taxonomy and diversity. So snakes are part of the class Reptilia. Their order is Squamata, which is scaled reptiles, so they're more closely related to lizards. And there are approximately 25 different families of snakes, the largest being Cluberdae. But that figure, there might be some variations to that because I think that number is including subfamilies. And if we get into the realm of subfamilies and subspecies, it can get more complicated, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And there are over 3,000 different species globally. Most of them are going to be found in Central America, South Africa, and Southeast Asia. And I will get into the North American species, what diversity we have here in a few slides. But let me just talk about some of the key traits and descriptions that people will use to describe different species. So lizards being their most closely related of the reptiles, the key factors that distinguish between these two orders are going to be all snakes are legless, although pythons and boas will have vestigial limbs. They are not functional limbs. They're just remains of tiny bones in the, um, the hip area that used to maybe once be limbs, but now they actually serve no function. And snakes do not have eyelids. Instead, they have a transparent covering known as a spectacle commonly, and some people refer to it as a braille. And so when, she, when snakes shed their skin, they also have to shed this outer covering, which is why you'll see, if you ever see a, sh a snake in shed, it's going to be a light blue color because they're actually shedding that eye cap as well. So in lizards, some lizards are legless, and I have a species from California shown right here, and, but all lizards will have eyelids. So if you ever to get these animals close um, side by side, one will have eyelids, one won't. All right, so that's snakes and lizards. And now we're going to get into the different descriptions for snakes and how people will describe a certain species. So one of them being is the color patterns. So species will have very distinct patterns, but sometimes there's going to be great variation. One species will have different colors, different patterns, so it can get a little complicated depending on which species it is. So right here I have on one side is going to be some of our venomous snakes in our in, um, in North America. So just showing how even amongst our venomous snakes, there's going to be some variation between each snake and the colors that they have. And 
this is how you would describe some of the patterns that you'll see. So a uniform pattern would be the snake is completely one color. It's uniform. Spectacle will just, you know, in between the scales will be different spots. So this is just a good way of how to describe what you saw. So instead of seeing like, you know, it was black and red, if you could describe it a little bit better, you know, the pattern was blotched, the pattern had diamonds, that's just a better way to go about describing a species than to just say if it was red or black. Well, how are the scales looking? Right, so that's color patterns. And for scales, more commonly, you're going to see smooth or keeled. Keeled scales, like what rattlesnakes would have, um, there's a little raised ridge along the scale, and it looks pretty dull um, in comparison to a smooth scale, where the smooth scales are just how it's described, it's smooth. So they're shiny in appearance, they reflect light better. So some snakes will even have both types of scales. They'll have a keeled dorsal scale, like the top part of them will have a keeled scales, and the belly will, will be smooth. So that's just a great way to describe the type of scales you're seeing. Okay, and here's another really great way to describe species or to help um, figure out what species it is. Um, the anal plate on the very bottom of the snake, it will be either divided or whole. So this is the image I have here for you to show you how it looks. And a lot of the times you'll, people will ask you, or you know, maybe they might not ask you, but it's just that's how you can describe the snake. Well, was the anal plate whole or was it divided? Because that's pretty uniform. You won't have much variation within a species on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so pupil shape is another one that, I mean, it comes to discussing snake species, venomous versus non-venomous, which we'll get into that a little more in a few slides. Um, pupil shape is very important. So how you can describe the pupil, whether it's, a round pupil, a vertical pupil, or elliptical can help distinguish between certain species. And so right here we have a lion snake and it has a round pupil. So one thing that people usually always say and ask about or how you can differentiate between venomous and non-venomous based solely on pupil. So the next slide, I'm kind of debunking that a little bit. Um, pupil shape is not the perfect way to describe whether a snake is venomous or not. It's a great way to help to identify a species, but when it comes to venomous or non-venomous, you're going to have differences. So, you know, there's always exceptions to these rules, so it's not very, it's not clear-cut as people like to make it seem very clear-cut. It's not. So, we have right here the California night snake. So, this snake is showing a vertical pupil. So this is a non-venomous snake. The snake is found in Colorado and other parts of the Western snakes. And it is not um, around people despite it being non-venomous. And, you know, and there's, a, there's other species that are non-venomous that also have vertical pupils. So it's just something to keep in mind when you look at different snake species in North America that, yes, a lot of venomous snakes will have an elliptical pupil, but there's also ones that don't have an elliptical pupil. So coral snakes, we have a few species in North America. They actually have a round pupil, so it's not elliptical at all. And then there's species that aren't venomous that have either or. So it's good to consider, but it's not the perfect way to distinguish between that venomous or non-venomous. And another fact, um, rattlesnakes, you know, they're usually seen with elliptical pupils. Um, they can actually dilate their pupil, you know, in response to light, just like any other animal could. So even a, a venomous snake that is known for having an elliptical pupil, sometimes their pupils actually may appear more round. So that's just another thing to mention that it's not perfect, and here's some reasons why. Okay, so head shape is another really great way of going about what kind of snake that you're looking at. So some of the images I have here, pit vipers, which is what rattlesnakes are, 
their head shape is very different compared to some other species of snakes in North America. But like I said before, head shape is still maybe not a perfect way to go about it because coral snakes do not have that kind of head shape. They're a different type of venomous snake. They're on the lapid, a, a lapid venomous snake, so they don't have the huge pits that some of our rattlesnakes and other vipers have. And another uh, interesting looking animal, so this one on the bottom there, with the, I guess um, someone was holding the snake, that is a western hognose snake. And you can kind of see at the side angle that it has a very pointed snout. So sometimes you'll see um, different articles or descriptions that, oh, snakes with pointed snouts could be venomous. Well, yes, it can be, but there's also non-venomous snakes, like this western hognose snake that has a pointed snout too. And this is actually a pretty unique shape of head for this animal. So it's just another thing to, to look into when you're trying to describe a snake. Well, what was the shape of the head? And another thing I want to mention, so the rattlesnake um, shape of the head and all the tiny scales on the top of their head that, that you can see here in the black and white image, um, different, you can help to um, distinguish between different venomous snakes by the scale pattern on top of their head as well. So most rattlesnakes will have these tiny scales, but the masagua, which is also in that um, family of snakes, they have more large plates. So if you're trying to really get down to, okay, I have a venomous snake here, what is it? There's different ways to go about distinguishing between different species too. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to get into the venomous snake characteristics. So one thing that I just want to mention right after that is that when you're describing a snake, using the term poisonous, it's not the proper term, and a lot of herpetology people will probably get a little annoyed. Well, not, not, not annoyed, but, well, they're not poisonous. Venomous and poisonous are, are very different. Um, they might have the same sort of function at the end of the day where, you know, you don't feel well, you're sick, or some sort of there's something going on in your body. But a venomous animal, there has to be a motor delivery. So what I mean by that is there has to be something that can penetrate the skin in order to get the venom into the body. And the venom has to enter the bloodstream in order to be effective. While poisonous, which amphibians, some amphibians are, and other animals, um, some poisons, you can absorb them directly through your skin or you can ingest them, and that's when they cause a problem. So a venomous animal... Like snakes have fangs, so that's what's how they're going about injecting you with venom. Poison, you have to really ingest it or absorb it to really cause a problem for you. And another thing is the purposes of each are different. So for most venomous snakes, while it can be used for defense, the, primary, um, the, the main role for venom was to immobilize their prey. That is what it, it evolved to be. Um, Snakes don't have any limbs. They have no way of getting their food into their mouth. So some snakes went the route of, well, if I can, you know, kill this animal, and then it, it's easier for me to ingest it if it's no longer moving and struggling. So while some animals' constrictors will kind of go about it the more forceful way, um, venom was really designed to make it easier for the snake to ingest their meal. So venom is more of a, I need to eat, and this is the best way to go about eating. It may be used for defense. If it's a last minute, you know, I have to, I'm, you know, I'm going to get hurt by this coyote. This animal is going to eat me. I really need to, you know, defend myself. And yes, they'll use their venom. But venom is very costly to the animal to produce. So they don't want to waste their venom either. While poison, its primary function was to dis defend themselves. So if a toad was picked up by an animal in their mouth, having these secretions over their body was a way of helping them escape a predator. So now that I've kind of described venom and poison and the different roles they have, now we can get into the North American species that are venomous. So most of the ones that we have here are pit vipers, like the rattlesnakes I mentioned. And what you're going to see with most pit vipers is that they're going to have heat-sensing pits. So they see an infrared. That's how they go about 
their eyesight. They really don't have any. It's not very good. Um, like some other venomous snakes have excellent eyesight, like cobras, but we don't have any cobras here. And another thing that's a key characteristic that is unique to rattlesnakes or this genus or group of rattlesnakes is rattlers. You're not going to see rattlers on pretty much any other animal. So this is these are two really important features when you're talking about venomous snakes in North America. Heat sensing pits and rattlers. And I might want to mention that if you see the shape of the rattlesnake's head, that brow ridge is also a little unique. Not, you don't commonly see that in other um, North American species. So just the shape of their head, and you can appreciate this photo, how it was taken, you kind of get to see right behind the eye is a very large, it's like that's where the venom is, that's the, the gland. And then the brow ridge above the eye, and then there's the nostril, and then below the nostril is the heat sensing pit. So that is a venomous snake, and I'm going to go on to the next slide now. All right, so another really important thing that I think everyone kind of wants to know more about is um, how to go about prevention and first aid if anything were to occur. So the most important thing you can do is know what is in your area, what can you expect. So if you live somewhere that rattlesnakes are common, then that's good for you to know that and just be aware of your surroundings. So most likely if you're hiking and you're in their habitat, just being aware of your surroundings, watching where you step your foot, watching where you put your hand, just be very aware that rattlesnakes live here and I'm walking through their home, so I need to know that. And dressing appropriately. So if you're in the season where rattlesnakes are more common to come, you know, to see, maybe wearing long pants would be more appropriate just in case you walk over a log and there's a rattlesnake there and you scare them, they're alarmed and they go to strike, it's probably a little better to have longer pants on just in case. So dressing appropriately is something to consider. Um, hiking in pairs, of course, is something to consider. You know, having someone else with you in case of an emergency is always a good idea. And probably the most important piece of this is do not pick up the snake. So avoid contact. Um, we're going to get into some species and how they how they look similar to rattlesnakes. But at the end of the day, if you don't know if it's venomous or not, the best bet is don't touch it, don't pick it up, take a photo of it, and they will not actively pursue you if they feel threatened. So if you stepped on a rattlesnake, they might be alarmed. <laughs> um, but otherwise, they're not going to come after you. So just knowing that. And but if, but if anything were to happen, if you were to be bit by a snake, um, you know, remaining calm and first and foremost, moving away from the animals so they don't have the opportunity to bite again. And, you know, seeking medical attention is first and foremost, too, once you back away from the animal, um, to how, how to go about getting medical attention. And if you're going to be a little bit time going by before you can get medical attention right away, cleaning the wound. And what, what people always see in movies do not suck the venom. I mean, you're not going to suck the venom out. So don't even put your mouth anywhere near the wound. Um, you can't. Once the venom has been injected into you, it is, it's already going through your bloodstream. So trying to suck it out, it's, it's, you might actually do more harm than good. So don't even bother doing that. And another thing is that used to be a practice was uh, applying tourniquets, so restricting the blood flow. Um, do not restrict blood flow. The best thing you can do is take off your jewelry and take off any tight clothing to make sure that you're not causing unwanted inflammation or trauma. You don't want to cut off circulation. You want your body to respond to what's going on. And by cutting off circulation, you might pose more of a threat for other issues, like different kinds of infections and stuff. So it's just better not to do that. And there's another old thing that people used to do was bleed the wound. The venom's already in you, so you can't suck it out, can't bleed it out, so don't do that either. And applying ice isn't a good idea. Um, and just limiting your movement in general and remaining calm is going to be the most helpful to you besides getting medical attention. So now that I've said that, um, if, if there's any questions, I'll answer them later if you want to go into more detail on that. But I just wanted to mention that 
since it is something to, it's, it's very important for people to know if anything were to happen, depending on where you live and how common rattlesnake bites or any kind of bite is. All right, so here's the North American species. So out of North America, we have a few families of snakes. We have Leptotyphlopidae, which are blind snakes. We have the family Boidae, which are just two species, rubber boas and um, rosy boas. And then we have Colubridae, which is going to be the most species that we have here. And now for the two venomous families that we have, we have a lapis and we have a uh, Viperidae. So the difference between those different families of venomous snakes is that basically the types of fangs they have that go about injecting the venom. So elapids, which are going to be for us, coral snakes and sea snakes, they have front six fangs, so they're very short fangs, and they, they basically need to strike downward in order to bite you. So that's one way of how they classify these venomous snakes. And for the ones that we have more commonly, like rattlesnakes, they have front rotating fangs. So they actually can maneuver their fangs, and I've seen rattlesnakes actually walk their food into their mouth using these fangs. And that is different um, in terms of, so for the lapids, they have to strike downward in order to really bite you. And for the vipers, they can kind of, they can turn their head and they can, if you were to hold one, and if you were a professional and you're, and you're handling one of these snakes, the chance of getting bit is still something to be concerned about because they can maneuver their head in such a way and the way their fangs are positioned, they can still bite you. So these are just how they classify these two different venomous um, families. And now what I, what, what I mentioned down below that is that this um, list of species it does not include subspecies. Um, there's a lot of debates and depends on who you talk to in the reptile field um, on what they consider to be a subspecies or not. So that does not include subspecies just to keep things simple. I, I just didn't mention those, although um, it just really depends on who you talk to when it comes to subspecies. So sub, some of them are actually, yes, this is a subspecies. We have genetic data that can suggest that, and then some not so much. So I'm just going to leave the subspecies out there and keep things simple. And the photo I have there, that is a non-venomous species. That is a yellow belly bracer. Okay, so now, now we're going to talk about um, the, the differences between these groups of animals. So these three snakes right here all live within the same area. And on one side, we have the venomous copperhead. And on the other side, we have some non-venomous species, which are one of them is a water snake and the other one is a corn snake. So the reason I put these two, um, these three together is that to show that there are some species that look very similar to one of the more venomous species. So the juvenile water snake, as they grow into adults, their color changes and they become, their color is very dull. But when they're juveniles, the way their pattern is and how their colors are looks very similar to a copperhead. And the corn snake sometimes is also mistaken as a copperhead as well for the same reasons, the blotched pattern and the coloration. So these are just, you know, showing you that, you know, we have some animals that look very similar to our venomous um, copperhead. And that's why it's always important to... Just don't, if, if you're not sure, don't pick the animal up. It's just better for you, better for the snake. Just leave them alone. So this is just a really great way of showing you. Now, if you were to get into the more specific details, you'd see that, well, the copperhead, they have heat-sensing pits. And the shape of their head is a little more distinct. The water snake above, they do not have heat-sensing pits, and neither does the corn snake. But in order to really key out these traits and say, oh, no, this actually isn't a copperhead, you kind of need to get pretty close to the animal to verify that. And it's just not, it's not safe. If you're not sure, it's just better to stay away and say, I'm not sure if that's a copperhead or not. I'm just not going to pick it up. Because although you might be able to figure out what it is once you actually hold the snake, if it's a venomous snake, well, that's not a good idea, is it? So that's just these three species here. I'm going to go on to the next group. Okay, 
So these two snakes are native to, I believe, Florida, or the more southern snakes on the East Coast. And this is one of our only coral snakes native here. I think there's one or two others. Well, there's one other coral snake and a, a sea snake. So these ones are native to the same area. They live in the same place. And they look very similar at first glance. So you're going to see the eastern coral snake. The pattern is a little different, but at first glance, and if you're not sure, it could look very similar to the king snake or the king snake, vice versa, looks very similar to the coral snake. So that's just showing that these two snakes, although, you know, it would be disastrous to pick up one and find out it's venomous, um, they do look very similar. So if you were at the side-to-side comparison, they, they have some differences. The, the yellow is different, the, the exact pattern in which they go by. And I know there's a lot of those, you know, stains people have. But if I'm in the moment, I'd rather not try and go through my head. What was the stain? What was the stain? Was it red and black? Is it? Like, it's just not worth it. I'd rather not double guess and not be sure and try and reiterate some sort of poem in my head about if it's venomous or not, it's just safer to not pick it up. So I'll leave it at that. So there's that species comparison. And all three of these snakes are also lit in the same area. One is a a prairie rattlesnake, and the other two, um, the top one is a western hognose snake again, and the bottom one is um, a bull snake. So the coloration... At first glance, very similar. The type of scales are pretty similar. Um, prairie rattlesnakes have keeled scales, and the western hognose, the scales are similar, and the patterns are similar. Um, if you were to flip the underbelly of the western hognose snake, there's a different color pattern than, than um, the rattlesnake. And but more importantly, the two non-venomous species don't have rattlers. So that's probably the number one. If you approach any of these snakes, you're going to see that there's no rattler. I don't hear any sort of warning. Although the hognose snake, um, I can't speak for the bull snake, but I can speak for the hognose snake. When you approach or maneuver in any way, they do puff up and make a lot of noise. So that might be a little alarming at first. But like I said before, if you're not sure, better not to pick it up. Um, and there's one thing I did want to mention. So I have it listed here as non-venomous. And a fun fact about the hognose snake, they technically are rear fanged venomous snakes, although they are, they're not really that venomous. So when it comes to ownership of venomous animals, they're not even listed as venomous. Their bite, if they ever bite you, is completely harmless to humans. So although while some might consider them to be venomous, in reality and in practicality, they're really not venomous um, as far as like injuring you and what we consider to be, yeah, the rattlesnake is in the pack more punch than this animal would. So I just want to throw that out there so that, yes, cognitive snakes are technically venomous, but how they're classified and how people speak about them, they really aren't. And I'll go on to the next slide. So this is a great way of showing you that even within a certain group of non-venomous snakes, identifying them can be pretty tricky. So garter snakes, um, these are all Western species. They Now, if you first glance at all these animals, um, they have round pupils. They have keeled dorsal scales, and I believe smooth belly scales. They have that pigmented um, stripe going down their back. Um, That stripe, even within these three different species, the stripe will vary in color. So, you know, the same exact species, so like the one on the top there, Sertalis, that stripe right here is a little more duller in color, but they have been known to have different colors uh, of that stripe. And all these snakes have dark blotches in their body pattern, and all of them have a single anal plate. So at first glance, you're like, wow, I can't tell the difference between them, and I have a hard time telling the difference between them. But if you were to get closer, there are some differences. So the one species that I pointed out with the pigmented um, stripes between, the bars between their 
upper mouth scales, they're the only ones out of these three that have that. So if you run across a snake with that, and depending on where you are, that might be that particular species of garter snake. The other two do not have that. Um, so when it comes to distinguishing between those two, there's subtle differences. So differences between the color in some parts of them, the different patterns, and scale counts are probably going to be more important. Although between rattle, um, garter snakes, it's a little tricky still because I've seen keys that say, well, this particular species has seven to eight um, labial scales. So labial scales in the picture I have below are the red, are um, outlined red. So one way of identifying between certain snakes would be to count those scales. How many of those scales do they have from under the nostril to the end of their mouth? And even with garter snakes, there's still variation even within the same species. So it can be really tricky even identifying these snakes. Um, but this is a great, a great way of showcasing that there's very subtle differences that even the trained eye would have to look for. Okay, so another, other factors to consider is obviously where you live and what species of snake you know are native to that area. And if those species of snakes are known to be invasive or not. So if you live in Florida and you might be, you might run across some snakes that aren't native there, such as uh, Burmese pythons that I'm sure most people are familiar with, um, and, and, and other constrictors as well. So there's other constrictors that have been introduced accidentally or intentionally, whether someone let them go or not, to an environment. So kind of knowing what can be expected for your area is important. And as far as habitat goes, does this species even live in this area? So where I live in Colorado, browse snakes are pretty common throughout the state, but depending on what elevation you're at, you might not even find a rattlesnake. So anything above 9,000 feet, it's going to be very rare to see a rattlesnake. So if you're hiking and you know, you know you're at like well over 9,000 feet, the likelihood of finding a rattlesnake is pretty slim. So that's kind of a good thing to know. And then also the time of the year and the time of day. You know, is, is this snake known to be active during the day? And are they known to be active at night? Um, is this breeding season for them? You know, just pretty much knowing where you live and knowing anything about these particular species, doing a little bit of homework about that. These, these are all great things to help contribute to identifying certain species of snakes. And I think that's all I have for this. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them. Okay, let me just go through some of the questions if you've had any. We had a question earlier, and it was about why the use of ice was a bad idea. Why it's a bad idea? Why, why the use of ice on a, on a snake bite was a bad idea? Oh, why the use of ice? Um, so your body and your immune system, the way they respond to things happening. So if you were bit by a venomous animal, whether or stung by a bee or anything like that, your body um, has certain immune immunological cells that will respond to inflammation and to temperature. So when you apply ice to an area, you might be hindering your body from responding accordingly to what's going on. If that, if that makes any sense or should I should elaborate on that anymore? That, that makes sense to me. That, that question was asked by Brandon earlier and that's a good job of answering it. Does anybody else out there have any um, questions? You can go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll make sure. I, you might not can see the uh, chat box, Katrina. But I'm looking at them now. So. Okay. So you see the one from Dawn that says she'll be hiking. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll answer Dawn's question about um. So it really depends on temperature. And since we've been experiencing warmer weather later into seasons, um, 
when I looked for rattlesnakes in early June, yes, I'm crazy, I looked for rattlesnakes. Um, when I looked for rattlesnakes in early June, it was really cold. So um, I wasn't very lucky. I found only one. Now, the warmer the, the season is, you're going to find a lot more rattlesnakes. So a few of my friends that have been going on hikes and, you know, looking for reptiles and amphibians in the wild, they, throughout the summer, they have found a lot of rattlesnakes. So it really just depends on the temperature. So if it's been pretty, if it continues to be pretty warm out, then you might run across some of them. But if you're hiking in the Rocky Mountains, like I said before, the elevation, if you're hiking at 4,000 elevation, you're probably not going to see any rattlesnakes. Um, like I said, though, there's always acceptance to everything, so I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't explicitly guarantee it. I just say it's very rare to come across them at higher elevations. I hope that answered your question. No, thank you. That was awesome. You guys, we're going to take some more questions, but if you will look at the slide now, there is a, a URL up there, if you will. in mind if you could go there it'll just ask you a few more survey questions and we would really appreciate it so let's look back over here in the chat box because i know a few more have been asked uh, i think someone mentioned about i had here's one two uh oh just went have you heard that copperheads are likely to be found in the evening between nine to midnight preying on um, newly so emerged cicadas I'm sorry, well, what about cicadas? Preying on cicadas newly emerged. Um, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, copperheads, just knowing physiologically that they have these heat sensing pits, they're basically, since they have these heat sensing pits, they're looking for warmer prey. So they're probably, they're primarily eating rodents and mammals which is why they're very, snakes like this are very important ecologically because they do a lot of pest control as far as the other types of pests like rats and other um, vermin like that. So I never heard of the mean cicadas um, just, and it's simply for the reason that I know that they have these heat sensing pests. I don't, I don't think that they would ever eat a cicada. Um, and I will fly answer some question about Oh, as far as diurnal, um, meaning during the day or not at night, um, once again, because how they're hunting, they're probably going to do most of their hunting in the evenings. Um, when, when the rodents that they're going to be eating come out are more active, and when the landscape is kind of a little more conducive to seeing warmth. So if the landscape's a little cooler, and then you see this warm image move by, they are like, oh, and that's probably a rat. And they're ambush predators. So while you might see them moving around, depending if it's breeding season or anything like that, um, they're probably they're they're mostly lion weight predators. Um, so unlike cobras, which we don't have, um, they're not actively hunting their prey. They're kind of just sitting there and waiting for it. Now they might be active if it's breeding season. And they have to go look for a female. Then you might see snakes moving about for that reason. And another thing I want to mention, so when I've seen copperheads, it's been while well, I was hiking in the Everglades and it was, they were on the road at night. So the asphalt retains a lot of heat. So that tends to draw in some snakes to it because it's still warm and they want to continue warming their bodies. So I've seen them on the roads at night for that reason. And I hope that answered her question. And I just wanted to mention about someone that asked about suction kits. I don't recommend it. Um, it's not going to do anything for you. Um, like I said before, once the venom is injected into you, it moves throughout your bloodstream pretty fast. Now, I didn't really get into the different types of venom, um, just because, like, I just wanted to kind of keep this talk a little more limited. But since I have some time, there are different types of venom. So there's cardiotoxic venom, which as it implies, really targets certain types of tissue. And then there's neurotoxic venom, which just has an overall nervous system, it just overall affects the nervous system. And then there's cytotoxic venom, which is going to cause local, like, cell death. That's what it's going to do. That's basically what it implies. So rattlesnakes tend to have 
more cardiotoxic venoms and cytotoxic venoms. Um, I'm not going to say every rattlesnake because that's, I don't want to um, be too, I don't want to simplify it too much, but I do want to just say that it's mostly cardiotoxic venom and some cytotoxic venom. Elapids like cobras, they're the ones that have more of a neurological venom. But venom, which is why I find it so fascinating, is it's a very complicated cocktail of mostly proteins and enzymes and one species of rattlesnake might have a different amount or different types of cocktail versus another species of rattlesnake. So even within the same genus of snakes, you're going to have some diversity in the type of venom they have. And then when you talk about completely different classes or families of venom snakes, what they're most likely to have are different too. So um, I'm, I'm going to leave it there since it, I can go on about venom more, but I don't want to get too complicated with it. Did you see the question from Jimmy about the snake being trapped in his plastic netting on the blueberry bushes? It seems like there were several snakes biting each other, and he is wondering if maybe they were wrapped around the female. Okay. So, based off of a kind of the picture I had in my head of multiple snakes wrapped around or bungled around each other, I, I want to say probably garter snakes. Um, as far as behavior goes, they're known to do that. Um, so it's basically what they do is a breeding ball. And it's just a bunch of males all trying to breed with a female. And a funny fact about garter snakes is that, well, I find it funny is that young males who are too young to breed quite yet or definitely will be dominated from the older males, they will actually secrete pheromones to pretend that they are females. So driving the attention away from the female snake to them, and then hopefully that they can go breed with the female themselves. So um, that's kind of an interesting thing that garter snakes do. And another thing that some snakes do is that they have a club. So once they copulate with a female, um, they'll try and plug up her cloaca so that no one else can breed with her, just kind of to, that's me, my offspring, no one else's. But garter snakes are known to do that. Um, the female will secrete pheromones that will draw the males to her, and then everyone's trying to get their shot at breeding with her, basically. And as far as some of them dying, I really can't speak of why they were dying. Um, but the biting and all that, that's just that to me sounds like breeding behavior if there's a female involved and multiple snakes involved because otherwise snakes don't really go after each other like that. Um, some snakes eat other snakes, but in this scenario that he's kind of describing, it seems more like a breeding scenario to me. And I think someone also asked, anything good to put into a generalized snake bite kit? Um, besides your usual, like, antiseptics or things like, you know, like, um, things to clean the wound with, I really don't have too many recommendations for a snake bite kit. I mean, your best bet is getting straight to a hospital where they can start administering, um, antivenom and giving you fluids and monitoring your heart rate. That's kind of the best thing that you can do. Um, there's really no kit that can help you. I mean, the antivenom is really what you, what you need at that point. What you can do that help will help you is what I mentioned before is when you're on your way to the hospital or maybe even a little bit of time because you're stuck in a hike or something, unfortunately, like, you know, an, an unfortunate place to be in, just in that time frame before you get to the hospital is really like cleaning the wound, don't apply pressure to it, don't cut off circulation, um, those types of things are going to be, that's more of the, what you need to do before you go to the hospital and what you shouldn't do before you go to the hospital. But at the end of the day, you really need to go to the hospital because they, they're the ones that are going to be able to help you the most. Okay. Did you see the question about do, will a water moccasin attack swim? Yeah, I was just reading that one. So to answer Kathy's question, um, they don't attack. So snakes don't really attack people. Um, most commonly, I mean, North Carolina is known for um, snake bites. I, mean, I think I heard, I, I read somewhere that 9,000 
people go to the emergency room for snake bites every year. And fatality is extremely rare. But more importantly, the reason that they go, like the reason there's so many bites is mostly from people picking up the snake or the snake is put in a position where it's fearful. So like I said before, snakes with venom, they don't want to waste their venom. They save their venom for when they need to eat because without their venom, they really can't eat. If they can't mobilize their prey to safely ingest it, then so it, it's just very costly for their body to produce venom. So the snake isn't going to see a person and then go towards them and bite them. That's just not how behaviorally they function. If you were to step on a snake accidentally or get so close to them that they perceive you as a threat, then yes, they may bite you. If you pick them up, then they definitely perceive you as a threat, and then they're going to bite you because, well, you know, yes, I'm going to waste some venom right now potentially, but hey, if I die, it's kind of worse. So they will perceive that as a threat, you picking them up or being too close to them, which is why rattlesnakes have their rattlers because they're doing what they can to prevent having to use their venom for unnecessary reasons. So they'll use their rattler to kind of warn you, you know, hey, you're getting too close to me. Please back away. I don't want to have to bite you. I kind of want to save my venom for real reasons, but if you're going to harm me, then I have to use it. So I would, so I would never say water mockings are attacking someone. If someone accidentally grabbed one um, while they're swimming or came too close to one and they perceived you as a threat, then that's when the bite occurs. And I'm just going to try and read another question. There's one from Janice Potter. Is it true that a hospital can tell what kind of snake has bitten you? Um, no, not, it depends on, well, it depends. So if they're a hospital that are, they are very used to getting snake bites, then they might have an idea because they know, well, more commonly people come in for rattlesnake bites. More commonly people come in for copperhead bites. So they might have more of a, you know, through trial and error, just, you know, through working and seeing so many rattlesnakes or venomous snake bites coming through, they might have an idea of what snake bit you. But if you can't show, like, the best thing will, if you are bit by a venomous snake, moving away from the snake is important, kind of getting a clear, it was a rattlesnake, you know, some sort of identification, maybe a picture would help. But they generally have their, they might have their go-tos for antivenom just based off of what they know is in the area and what they know is more common. So I don't think they can really tell exactly what snake has been you by the type of bite that you have. They might have ideas about it, but I don't think they can properly, like, 100% identify it. Um, they just know what's in the area, and they might go to that. I mean, if you tell them it was a more colorful snake, and if you live in an area that has coral snakes, then... They'll have, to, they'll have to switch up what kind of antivenom they might be using. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Why are, or can you explain why some of these snakes are having live births and then we have some snakes that have eggs? So, um, now, uh, okay, so viviparis, so viviparis is live births. What snakes have is not technically a live birth. It's avoviviparous, meaning they still have eggs, but the eggs are inside their body, and they are actively carrying the eggs. But when the eggs are hatching, then that's when the babies will come out, and it kind of looks like a live birth, but technically they're hatching from eggs. They're just inside the female. Um, and when they just hatch from eggs, some snakes will incubate them. Um, some snakes won't. So we don't really have like, well, I guess we sort of have, we have boas and pythons that do that, but they will actually incubate their own eggs by muscle twitching and they actually will generate some heat to keep their eggs warm. So that's more of the bigger constructors that do that. Um, but as to exactly what your question is, as to why there's differences or is there anything else you want me to elaborate on? We, I just wondered if there were certain groups that were one way or certain groups that were another? Um, most colubrids 
um, like milk snakes and other snakes, they will lay eggs. Um, quite a few pythons, like ball pythons, will lay eggs. Um, bigger constrictors, like anacondas, will have this live birth. And different types of boas will do it. Um, there might be more snakes that do it that don't exactly fit the normal criteria. I think that has evolved independently throughout different types of snakes. But more commonly, I think you'll see it in like bigger, like anacondas, like boas. Thank you. I, yeah, you're welcome. And now, what else are we? Well, now we're now I see the the repellent question and moth salt. Okay, so as far as repellents go, um, if the so moth balls are not good for that, um, I would never, I, I wouldn't use moth balls for that reason. Um, other repellents that are marketed out there, I would be weary of purchasing them. Um, I would always, before purchasing anything, with that intention, I'd always do my homework first. Um, is this ecologically friendly? Is this environmentally friendly to use this? And is it actually tried and tested? Is there actual information and studies available that said, yes, this is good? I can't think of any real plants off the top of my head that are great for that. But just as, as an example, like mosquito repellents, um, there's only a couple mosquito repellents that are actually approved for repelling mosquitoes. There might be other products available that say that they can repel mosquitoes, but they're not reputable or they're not tried and tested. So there's only like maybe three things, three ingredients that are for sure good against mosquitoes. And I guess I'm trying to say that in terms of repelling snakes, doing your homework, researching the product you, you think you want to use and making sure it actually is effective. And if you're someone that's concerned about the environment, well, maybe looking into that as well. But I can't really off the top of my head think of any great repellents. And I might do a little research on that afterwards. And I mean, if you want, Danny, I can send you that information if I find anything. Okay. And see if there are any other questions. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I think Jenny had a we have a few people typing. I'm trying to look through and if I missed anyone's questions and I apologize. They say, can species interbreed? I'm sorry? They are, you have a question, can species interbreed? So that's when we get into the, the subspecies and that kind of conversation. So um, when, you call, when you talk about in, interbreeding, um, different species, can they hybridize? is really kind of where you're getting at. So certain animals can hybridize much like other animals can. So if we think about dogs and wolves or horses and different equines, um, yes, they can hybridize. Um, so there are species of snakes that can hybridize. I can't think off the top of my head as to which ones, but this just goes back into the subspecies part. and there is thought that the subspecies were probably created due to hybridizing between species, or potentially that could be what caused them. Um, as far as the species continuing, that depends on a few things. So if two species could successfully breed and successfully produce offspring, are those offspring sterile? Can they reproduce? And are those offspring that produced, can they... Can they do the behaviors and can they perform at the same way the parent species could? So sometimes, no, that's not the case. Sometimes the hybridized species, they're less successful at reproduction or they can't reproduce because they're sterile. But yes, species can hybridize. 
it just depends on which species and how closely related they are to the other species. So potentially garter snakes, different species within an area might be able to do that, but I don't want to really talk too much about that because there's still some debate and controversy about yes and no, and what, do we consider that some species now if we can? Um, so I'll leave it at that. I don't really know how else to continue answering it. Anybody else? I'm just going to go looking through more of the questions. Have I missed anyone from before? Um, was there any concern about finding snakes in your home or anything like that? This one says, answer the one. I've got to go back and find this question. Yeah, someone mentioned um, the carpet pythons and jungles. Yeah, so there, there is definitely species that can, but to some degree, we're kind of taking two species that aren't found in the same area and unnaturally doing that to them. So there's a lot of, when you when you want to talk about uh, captive breeding, that's when things get even more mucky because they're selectively breeding, they're mixing species that normally wouldn't geographically find each other. Um, so yeah, captive breeding is a whole other, is a whole other topic. I believe the question they were referring to is when a venomous snake dis fails its venom, how long does it take to generate more? So it depends how long on does it generate enough more to be able to produce enough to eat again. So it it depends on now adult venomous snakes, they have control over how much venom they will inject. So that's why you will you will hear about what they call dry bites is when a snake strikes but actually didn't use any venom because it used the strike as a, an additional warning, but it was like not concerned enough to use venom. So they, they, they can control the venom that they can um, inject into you, whether it's a lot, whether it's a little, whether there's none. If a snake were to completely empty their venom glands, um, I'm not exactly sure if it depends on, the, on each species, but I want to... Rough estimate, maybe a few weeks. Might be longer than that. I have to look into that a little further. Okay. Does the brown water snake venture from water? I want to say yes, although I'm not exactly sure what species they're referring to. There are a lot of species of water snakes. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly which one. Unfortunately, in many parts, they're they're all they're all venomous. <laughs> that's, that's what and people some, think. Anyway. And some water snakes aren't venomous. To a lot of people, unfortunately, they think they are. Yeah, we've had I've had that before. Yeah, but it was just it was just a war. I mean, and and the way that they look, and how big they are, and they have keeled scales, and it definitely at first glance you might think it's a venomous snake, which is more why I kind of summarize it with just don't pick it up if you're not sure or avoid contact with it. What about the, um, you know, you read all the time about about water snakes and, and different types of snakes in the water and if, it, if it's swimming on top of the water versus head up only. You hear that a lot as a way to be able to tell the venomous from the non-venomous snakes in the water. Oh, I'm sorry, what was um, you you hear a lot of times uh, if, the, if the snake is swimming on top of the water versus if the um, snake is swimming underwater. Would you call that a wise tail? Or is there truth no. to that? I don't, I don't think so. It seems too vague. And uh, this could be just how the snake's swimming, their buoyancy, how big they are. Um, do they normally swim in water? Yeah, I wouldn't use that as a characteristic of determining if they're venomous or not. Thank you. You're welcome. And someone... 
here we have, I was waiting on this one, any tips for keeping snakes away from facilities, whether it's a child care facility or, in this case, it is a child care facility. And is this child care facility in a state that has a lot of them snakes or their bites are frequent? Yeah, she says Texas. Okay, Texas. So they have quite a few. <laughs> I mean, is this going to um, be something like the is it food, water, shelter? Trying to keep the food, water, and shelter away, grass mowing. Yeah, I mean, I'm. It really just depends. I'm. I don't know how exactly to answer that in the best way. I'm not more into the pest control part of it. <laughs> just I just know kind of certain snakes. They like certain things. So if you have a yard with a lot of large rocks, snakes might congregate in that area because the rocks are warm and that's a place that they might want to be. So as far as repelling them from a child care facility, if you can find a really good snake repellent that actually is one that's reputable and works, that could be your go-to, but also just m managing and monitoring for that making sure, like, you know, going through the area and checking out the area for them. I've heard of snakes being underneath sod, so being mindful of how the sod is laid, and if you're ripping up sods, just kind of watch out for certain snakes underneath that. Um, yeah, and basically, I mean, if you have a rodent problem, then that might draw in more snakes. Or do we yeah, have Vicky, what Vicky is saying, keeping the rodents away, amphibians? Well, more of the venomous snakes in that area, I think they're more concerned about rodents, but other species of snakes will eat amphibians and insects as well. So, yeah, like what, what everyone else is kind of already suggesting seems like a good go-to. Like I said, pest management and control isn't really my forte, so I can just kind of brainstorm it right on the spot a little bit, but some of these answers are really good, too. Okay. Let's see. We have Dr. T. Yes, yeah, she's saying that some things use the same chemical as mothballs, and that might be true, but mothballs just aren't used. They, they don't have a pesticide label, and, and I wouldn't tell anyone to use something where it wasn't mentioned on the label. And IPM, yeah. I see that. Use your IPM practices, and that's exactly right, and that's going to be keeping the grasses low. Maybe and, uh, you know, considering the landscape that you're producing, is it a landscape that is inviting to rodents and is inviting to snakes? Um, you can kind of be mindful of that. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have when... So in our neighborhoods and in our areas, we might have taken the predators out of the equation. So any of these small pockets with large um, vegetation and growth, that's a great place for rodents to live. And they don't have the predators because the people in the area have kept them out. Um, so just knowing that, you know, that area, a lot of vegetation going on, probably a great place for field mice to live. And if there's food there, then the snakes will come with it. Super. This has been, hey, we really appreciate you stepping up today. This has been really, really awesome. Well, thank, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity, and I hope I could have answered and, you know, pro provided enough of my knowledge and shared it with everybody. But um, I'm definitely looking into the, the repellent aspect of it because that I'm not as familiar with. I just know that there's certain repellents like mothballs or no but I need to look into which ones are actually tried and tested because that to me is what everyone seems to be more concerned about, understandably so. So I was really excited to do this. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And if there's any more questions, I mean, I can pass you my email, Danny, and I can let people know. No, that's, that's fine. And then we get more questions, um, you know, later when people go back, people go back and watch this again, I will make sure and get them to you. You guys oh, yeah, and be, I'm um, definitely going to do my end of the work because there are some things that I probably couldn't answer in the best way possible, so I would like to 